Dad Pod. Well, this is a video thing as well. Does have a name. Podcast. A midlife crisis. Howdy, Daddy. Mm. Midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Dadcast. That's not bad, actually. Yeah. Dadcast: Misadventures in Parenting. Brought to you by Cadbury Fredo Treasures. Discover the new Fredo Treasures Space Series with Cadbury Dairy Milk Buttons, one surprise toy in every chest. All right, you're very welcome along to this week's edition of Dadcast. Uh, I'm going to start straight off the bat with some correspondence from Greg, who says, lads, 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 will you stop going on about the snip? It's the easiest procedure I've been through. I got it two years ago. I was 35. My youngest child was six months old. No needles, no scalpel, and more importantly, in capital letters, Dave, no pain. It's so easy. If you're going to get one in the future, do it now. It takes five minutes. I was in the playground with my kids a few hours later. You have a very dull ache for a day or two, but that's it. The worst part was the itch of the pubic hair growing back. You do that yourself in advance. Go for it, says Greg. To finally put this conversation to bed, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Emma Byrne to the show, a friend of the show for uh, many years. Normally, we talk rugby, but we had a glowing testimony, Emmett, last week from one of your very happy former clients who recommended you. We thought, well, look, let's get you on and get the truth and try and convince Dave live and in person that he needs to get this thing done that he's been banging on about for three years. All right, can I say, why is it always, why is the camera always focused on me? <laughs> like, you I promise. appreciate, Adrian only has a couple of kids and probably hasn't shut the door on augmenting his family numbers. Nathan, of all of us, I would have thought, would be driving to the hospital right now to get this done. As, uh, for you, as we pointed like, out previously, I'm too young. There's no, this is not an age-related issue. And as for you, Gilroy... You're at the other end of the spectrum. I would have thought you'd be banging the door down as well. Yet it all seems to be focused on myself, which is causing my hackles to be raised and driving me away from even considering getting the procedure done. So if that is your ultimate goal, you are not on course to achieve it. Sorry, Emmett, how are you? <laughs> um, you can you can already get a sense of it at the dynamic of <laughs> what he, he he committed last year. We we did a live show at Electric Picnic, and he committed in front of a live audience of at least twelve people that he was going to do this within the year. And yet here we are. Yeah, it's not like I committed to end world hunger and I've decided not to bother. Yeah, but when you when you declare something publicly, Dave, um, as I said, it doesn't go away. That's the thing, you know. Just um, it, it it'll grow and grow until uh, you'll you'll have the record then for the, uh, the longest. Uh, the the no one, uh, for example, no one uh, decides on a Friday, in my experience anyway, uh, on a vasectomy and pulls the trigger on Monday. It's a, it's a process that's drawn out over a long period of time. Um, three years would be slightly longer than um, the, uh, the average now. <laughs> Well, my uh, my youngest turns four in November, so it's it's been almost four years since I mentally decided that I was not going to have any more children. So, um, and yet here we are, four years later, and I'm no closer to pulling that trigger. Why I feel it? like we need to be on our best behaviour now that we have an actual doctor, because there was at least three times when Emmett was talking there where I wanted to go, hey. I'll <laughs> when, he's, when he's talking about Magnetar pulling the trigger on a Monday I was wondering what you were going on about that's what we need to stop yes that's at least at least try and feign maturity for the next hour I apologise it's out of my system yeah so I think like if I mean I don't want to misrepresent you Dave here and you rightly point out that you somehow have become the center of this conversation I don't think you've been an unwitting passenger in the whole thing I must add but a part of it feels to me and do correct me if I'm wrong and this is where we definitely want to get Emmett's expertise has been your uh, like how we've all cringed over the last couple of weeks particularly when the topic comes up about you know getting him what actually happened in, in, in the nether regions yeah so Emmett what happened Okay, so um, well, we have to look at the the big picture and narrow down first. Okay, so um, Dave, what 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 do you what do you know about vasectomy as thus far? What do you know about it apart from it? You know, it's a form of contraception. What would you say? Well, I we we were given a deep dive in last week's podcast, Emmett, by a, someone who was brought your name up, and you came highly recommended. And this person went through the procedure sentence by sentence. And that was um, the point at which my eyes were opened. In terms of the detail involved, more than it had been at any point. So we're f I'm far more educated on it now than I was a couple of weeks ago. Thanks, sir. Our loving listener last week. 
Great. Okay. Well, okay. So, like, essentially, like, you work back from what you want. Okay. Your goal is to is to have a you know is to be sterile and not be able to impregnate somebody. Okay. So that's the whole the whole premise of it. Okay. And you want to go through the simplest probably a uh, way of doing that that obviously lends itself to the least amount of side effects and to the most effectiveness okay so there your kind of dynamics all coming together so what would you say um you know what different types of contraception and what options are available to you that's what you look at first okay so you look at majority of contraceptions are, are of contraceptive uh, choices in fact all of them basically with the exception of vasectomy are pretty much i mean there is a cap and condoms that men can use but in terms of you know a long-term solution would be available to women so you're talking the pill and various different types thereof you're talking about the bar which goes into the arm which is uh, another form of kind of long-term reversible contraception you've got a coil uh, which works slightly more locally again as for the woman you've got a thing called a tubal ligation where they go in and they basically block the the, the, the fallopian tubes and the, and, the, and the woman, that's quite a, a big operation. You have then a very extreme end, you have, it's not used for contraception, but it sometimes lends itself in that way is a hysterectomy. And then you go to guys and their options. Now, the, the benefits of um, a vasectomy versus the, uh, so hormones are a continuous, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, way of managing uh, contraception that you have to think about it more regularly because you have to take them or you have to replace them. They can sometimes have effects outside of the effects you want to have because hormones have receptors in different parts of the body. So you can have different things like, you know, you've heard of some hormones don't suit women and some do and so on and so forth. And they can have an effect on them in certain ways that uh, is outside just uh, basic contraception. And they can also have po positive effects or outside of contraception, sometimes the coils are used to control, say, heavy periods and things like this as well. So it's just, it depends on what, uh, you know, what, what your absolute goal is. If it's just contraception, the simplest, most effective, without question, the most effective reversible type of contraception is a vasectomy. So that's one box tick, okay? So you're looking at what's the most effective. So you compare a vasectomy to any other form of contraception, whether it's tubal ligation, coils, um, um, the implanon, which is the bar, uh, the pill, the uh, condoms, if you compare it to any of those, it trumps them significantly by a factor of a minimum of 10, depending on the study you look at. So that's box number one ticked. So then box number two would be, so you're looking at, say, you do something, you make a decision, and then you're looking at the side effects of it. it would, like, is this going to cause me a problem? Is it not? Okay. So the, the side effects you have to look at is how how sometimes... Uh, women get more affected by by hormones than say other say some women get more affected say by the by the hormones in terms of an emotional sense or they feel tired all the time or it might make them feel a little bit unwell or in general it just doesn't agree with them okay now some women don't have anything at all and it, and it works very well for them so that's going to be a factor depending on the individual the uh the point the the side effects from a vasectomy, which I go through in, in quite a bit of detail, is you've kind of got short and long-term variants of them. Thankfully, the majority of them are quite rare in my experience. Now, the numbers are up in, say, in evidence. Like, vasectomies are done in the millions in China and America, and they, the studies are fairly evident to see what the actual numbers are in relation to, uh, to long-term side effects, which is the kind of thing you, you, you don't want. Short-term side effects are most common would be infection and I think and hematoma, which is a bleed, okay? So they're managed quite carefully. Like it's a technique that's done under, you know, obviously sterilized conditions, sterile conditions rather. It's very, um, it's very uh, uh, I suppose, calibrated how, how we do the procedure and very careful then, you know, beyond that to make sure that uh, if there's anything, you know, reduce the risk of bleeding and so on. And there's certain steps we put in place for that. So they're generally quite rare, but they do happen every so often. But generally when they do happen, they're managed in a fairly quick fashion. Like, you know, you're talking about if you did get a little infection or if you did have a hematoma, generally it's managed within a short period of time. So it's no problem. You can get the long-term effects, unfortunately, are, fortunately are quite rare. Um, again, it depends on what literature you're looking at. Some guys say it's one in a hundred. Sometimes say it's one in thousands in terms of the guys who are affected in a long-term sense. The effect you get is that there's a there's a little bit of a complication. Now, guys, if I'm going on too much about this, let me know. No, no, that's good. Yeah, no, this, keep going. Th this part is the key part where you've convinced me <laughs> once and for all never to do it. <laughs> Is it, no, it, it is very, it's quite rare, and certainly in my experience, it's very rare. But there, there is a, um, 
when you do, and I'll go through the procedure again, uh, I'll go back over what actually is involved in the process of the procedure as well. So you're, you, you, can, you can be left in no doubt. But, the, but when, you go through, when you go through the procedure, obviously there's certain changes when you have a, you, you separate the tube, if you like. And we, the modern form of vasectomy, again, I'll go into this in more detail later on, but it is called an open-ended vasectomy. So you seal one end of the tube and you leave one end open simply because on the end of the tube that's attached to the testicle, there's, you're still producing sperm. And if you block that, what happens is you can create back pressure. So, you, so that can sometimes lead to long-term, um, you know, kind of aches and so on. Now, the good news, the good news in, the, in the majority of times when you have pain in the testicle, it's not pain like you would associate with trauma there where you're on the floor holding yourself in the fetal position for about 10 minutes. If you've ever had a knock there, you get this kind of <laughs> intense pain that settles down into this low level kind of a heavy ache. And it's kind of like a mild version of that ache is what some guys feel and some guys don't. It's a 50 50 but it just depends on whether the particular nerve is stimulated or not during the procedure. But when you leave that open end, what happens is sometimes that there's an immunological, like an immune response to the sperm that goes into the open part of the, 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 the vast, the tube itself, that can sometimes lead to, I mean, without going, trying to, go, I can go into a bit more detail, but I think it would confuse the issue, but it can lead to uh, an immune response that causes a little bit of inflammation that's unpredictable down the line. Now that means that say in six months time, you could get a little bit of an ache. It may come and it may go. The majority of guys, one out of every 2000 that get that. And I'd say, you know, on average one out of every probably one to 200 guys may get that little bit of an ache. One out of every 2000 get a reversal. The majority of the guys, the ache is not that bothersome. It's just a very low level kind of sensation that will come and go and they can manage it. And then in very, very rare occasions, you get guys that they get a, a, an ache that will actually impact on their lives. And those guys sometimes elect to get a reversal. So to put it in context, like any like the long-term you know, consequences, if they were that common, guys wouldn't do it. And vasectomies are becoming more and more popular. And for those simple reasons that you look at the, the majority of the side effects coupled with the effectiveness of it, coupled with sometimes with the cost. I mean, it's a once-off cost, so it's between probably four and 500 euros for to get a vasectomy, but you're not continuously paying for tablets or for coils or whatever, like it's just a once-off and that's it. You don't have to think about it. It's, it's a mechanical fix, meaning that, you know, you don't have to worry about hormones hitting any other part of the body. So they're all the benefits. The one negative of a vasectomy that I would say is that the reversibility is not as simple as the other forms of contraception. So if you did, the, the key, to, to, to vasectomy, uh, I suppose long-term success is usually in a committed relationship where you are definitely sure that you want it. So that's the most important thing. It's not because you're afraid of the procedure that you don't get it. It's because you get it because you, uh, you know, you actually are a hundred percent sure that you won't ha want to have children down the line. And that's the most important thing because then you don't have to think about that reversibility thing. And that's the biggest um, downside that I, I would say. So guys who have made that decision in their mind and they're clear about it, um, and they've you know they've informed themselves on it, tend to be more uh, how to say, um, you know, you know, at peace with it. I suppose you'd say. And those guys, because uh, they they know that the other aspects of it generally trump the other forms of uh, of contraception in the long run. Oh, so I'm, I'm not even in the firing line here and I've got sweaty palms listening to all of this. <laughs> the, 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 one, one of the things, Emma, right, and like I've been painted as a bit maybe of a Neanderthal here on this topic over the last while, because certainly when it came up initially, um, like maybe a bit flippantly, but certainly on some serious level, like I always understood like part of the whole arousal package and um, execution package, let's call it, was that... Um, <laughs> that... Uh, that um, you know, that at some level you were operating on the basis that you were going to impregnate somebody like that. This is sort of the... the uh, you're directly linked. Is that what you're going yeah, to say? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so is, is, there, is there... Do you find people coming into you saying that they are worried or concerned uh, about... Hang on. The, that means, Adrian, you've never... Libido? Adrian, that means you've never done it on your own. Come and come. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> or well, or never not? use... You've never used a condom. <laughs> It's not. Yeah, but you, you suspend belief. The... <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about the psychological element of this. So basically, um, to answer the, the the side effects slash psychological side effects slash castration question from Asian there, it's just um, so 
the I, I suppose the best way to describe it first of all is that the all the vessels and the and the you know the testicle obviously has a few functions outside of um, producing sperm. Okay, so the most other the thing that people are most familiar with outside this producing sperm would be testosterone or or a thing. I often get asked that question: Will I lose my sex drive? Will testosterone drop? Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera, right. So. Because there's a tube, essentially, if you want to call it that, a sheath almost going down into the scrotum called the spermatic cord, okay? And that contains um, a lot of different nerves and vessels, okay? And basically, the vas deferens, or the vasa deferentia, which is the kind of proper term for it, is the tube that goes down that carries the sperm down as far. And it attaches to the part, a, a component of the, te- oh, it's a part of the testicle called the epididymis, which is essentially a, a network of tubes and veins. So to go from the start of the process is inside the testicle, you've got cells called Sertoli cells and you've got cells called Leydig cells. Okay. Now the brain sends a signal, starts with a thing called GnRH from the hypothalamus. That's going to have a trope release and hormone goes down to a part of the brain called the pituitary. The pituitary releases two hormones, one called follicular stimulating hormone. That stimulates the Sertoli cells and you're talking about production of sperm and then you have luteinizing hormone that goes down to a thing called Leydig cells and that produces testosterone. And they actually intertwine so if your testosterone levels drop your sperm levels drop okay so you need to keep like healthy guys generally you, you know the way and um, keep themselves well and keep the i'm, I'm talking about a normal sense good sleep exercise nutrition and all those things they produce like healthy levels of testosterone and um, age is a factor as well of course and then you can get some uh, some diseases that can affect that as well which are a bit more rare but essentially anyway you're producing testosterone you're producing sperm in the testicle Sperm goes from these Sertoli cells and it migrates up to this kind of, kind of. If you feel the top of the testicle, you'll feel this spongy kind of sensation. That's the and this this epididymis. It goes in there and it basically matures in there, and that's directly linked to this single tube. And it's one part of a component of this spermatic cord that's within all the other parts. So you've got like a thing called the panpiniform plexus, which is a network of veins that come from the testicle. You've got the testicular artery. You've got different nerves going down there and so on. So basically, the tube. Uh, the, the vast deference tube that carries the sperm basically travels from this epididymis up and it goes in a kind of loop around up into the pelvis and down. So it's, it's over a foot long generally and it goes down and it goes past these two ducts called seminal vesicles. Okay, the seminal vesicles. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, it's a bit. The, the foot long, the foot long result in a few, uh, few smirks there, Emmett. <laughs> obviously, you see the problem is there must be a delay on this because uh, that, 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 I'd said that about ten seconds before. Everyone's <laughs> <laughs> trying to be professional and not laugh. You see. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but anyway, the, the uh, these seminal vesicles produce the semen. Okay, this is another thing I need to put the spell as well, and then that joins in with the with basically the tube itself that carries the sperm. They all mix together roughly around where the prostate is, and then you ejaculate. Okay, so the the the, the thing that makes um, the vasectomy effective uh, is that that tube that carries the sperm has one purpose and really one purpose only. Okay, so we separate all the different vessels, like the the, the you know the the blood supply and the that'll be carrying the hormone supply, the lymphatics, the drain that drain out the you know all the other kind of you know waste products and other different things come from testicle that which the vein the, the vein the venous blood does the same thing takes the oxygenated blood back up into the heart to get oxygenated and back down so you can kind of stimulate and keep the cells healthy and so on so so this tube that carries the sperm has one that once you block that only one thing changes in the in the whole body and that is you stop sperm getting into the semen sample and as, as i explained the semen it's easier to diagram but that is basically downstream of where we make the separation so it's not affected and the this the sperm itself contributes to about one to two percent of the volume of the semen so even after a vasectomy you won't notice anything the only thing is is that when you block that tube it stops the uh, the sperm getting into the semen sample and then obviously you can't get somebody uh, pregnant but and it's very effective of that uh, very effective at that very rarely there's a one in 1,000 failure rate for the procedure itself, and that's because the body, when you, when you block a vessel, when you take a vessel out of, like, if you block a heart vessel, for example, and I'm not talking about suddenly because that'll cause a, a heart attack and stuff, but if you if you slowly get a plaque building up in the, in the lumen or the hole of, of an arterial vessel supplying the muscle of the heart, and you get a slow blockage of it, 
what happens is the blood supply diminishes and the body reacts to that and it creates a, a it releases different proteins and different signaling uh, um, I suppose you'd say proteins to, to grow new vessels, collateral pathways they call them. And the, 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 the body does the same with the VAS as well through, through a process with scar tissue where it can actually in very rare occasions create uh, I suppose a collateral pathway for the sperm to travel and link the two tubes. So that's why you have failure rates in, in vasectomies. But we test samples. So what we do is we block it. I'll go through the procedure now in a sec so you know what's involved. And then you will wait about three to four months again. This is based on evidence-based medicine, certain number of ejaculations. But I, I found that about between three and four months is the best time to test in relation to getting that sweet spot between the failure and between waiting for the, uh, the um, what we call uh, clearance of the tubes. So, um, so if that, if you have a positive test, in other words, if you have semen in the, or sorry, sperm in the semen sample after between three and four months in the test, then there's a really good chance that that um, your uh, your tubes have actually relinked through this thing called process called early recanalization, and then it's a repeat vasectomy. But that's extremely extremely rare. Most of the time, it's it, it works. And then if you have a clear sample at that time, the chances of a late recanalization is extremely rare. But they say, and again, and it depends on the numbers you're looking at. In the US, they say one, like in, over the course of like 20 years, one out of every 3,000 vasectomies, something producing pregnancy. But again, you could ask a guy, the guy I trained with in America did something like 45,000 vasectomies, a guy called Doug Stein, and he's a, he's a urologist over there doing them. He's basically the the, the vasectomy man over there, and he his, his failure rate would be, late failure rate would be way, way lower than that. Right. Are you open to being sued if somebody comes back <laughs> child in hand? <laughs> situation, but no. Uh, <laughs> Terms and conditions apply. Uh, we, 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 yeah, obviously, the most important part of any procedural, any procedure regardless, vasectomy is extremely simple, right? I, like, in a sense. I mean, there are challenges in it. Um, and again, I'll go through it now in a second. I'll even show you the instruments involved. But but the, um, don't worry, Dave, it won't be that bad. But the, uh, <laughs> um, with any procedure, any medical, and I, or anything, when you're giving somebody something, whether it's medication, a procedure, or anything, I'll just, you know, any doctor will say this, is that, the patient needs to be very well informed of the potential, you know, pros and cons of everything. And you've made everything very, very clear. And like, and failure is one of those um, things that can happen, uh, and 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 pregnancy and so on and so forth. They need to know that that can happen. It's extremely rare. The odds are stacked on the side of them not getting somebody pregnant. I suppose, uh, particularly if they follow, like if we if you follow the right guidelines and so on, but the, as in testing after you get get it, you know, you get a tear sample and so on in form in, in the three to four months. It's but there's no such thing as a hundred percent unless you get a hysterectomy, which obviously it's not a form of contraception. It's it's usually done for more serious things. So um so that would be um you know so once you explain that then and you, people sign a consent form, you know, I mean that's yeah. that's the way it works. You're so they know that they know their risks and the benefits and so on. And and with any medical decision, the the benefits and this is the most important thing for you, Dave. That you, if you if you take nothing home today, take this home. The benefits have to outweigh the negatives. That's the way you just look at it. And then if that's the thing, then you uh, you you make a decision based on that. So all the specialisations in med medicine. How did you end up in a position where you had decided to cut men's ball bags in two? <laughs> <laughs> Start off with that intense, no? So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty simple, actually. I, I I trained as a GP, so I'm a GP. I'm GP trained, and I trained out under. I was training with a, a guy called Michael Kennedy, who's in um, in Clane. The very first vasectomy clinic. You'll actually like this story, actually, because he's a very interesting guy. Is a guy called, was set up by a man called uh, Andrew Rin, Doctor Andrew Rin. I don't know, you might have heard him, may not have heard him. He's very well known for a few reasons. He's in the media a little bit. Um, Andrew's now retired, but he um, he was shot, would you believe, by one of his patients who he did a vasectomy on. And it's a, it's a well-known story. He's very famous within medical circles anyway. But uh, Andrew trained out in Canada uh, in the 80s. And uh, this guy was married to... Um, what was he? Uh, 
he, he, Christy Moore, he, was, he, he used to tour with Christy Moore. He used to do, like, he used to play a lot of, like, trad music and stuff when he toured. And he was married to Christy's sister. So he was kind of, you know, he's quite a, an interesting character. And uh, he, um, he trained a vasectomy out in Canada, came back and set up the first clinic in the late 80s, early 90s. And that was the first vasectomy clinic ever in Ireland. And he, um, he had a patient that, um, now obviously, you know, there was, there was stuff going on, but he had a patient who I think from what I remember is in the story that had this girlfriend and the girlfriend didn't want to have any children. So he, now Andrew wrote a book about this, like, so it's not, uh, this is fairly well known. <laughs> uh, he, 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 uh, so he, the, the patient, um, I'm just trying to remember the order correctly, but the patient, the patient decided he was going to honor this girl's, you know, with the best thing he could do for girls and her, her desires, if you like, you know, and that would say, well, I'll get a vasectomy if you don't want to get pregnant. So, so Andrew was the guy and he went in and he got his vasectomy. And then as things happen, of course, they broke up and sometimes that happens. And then um, she met somebody else and then within three months she was pregnant. So obviously he wasn't too happy. So he went back to Andrew and said, I want this reversed. And of course, a vasectomy reversal is called a vasovasostomy. Okay. It's a, it's a much more complex procedure than, uh, to put, to coin it the way Doug Stein, the guy who I trained under in America, he said, it's much easier to break a coffee cup than it is to put it together. And, and, you know, with, with, a, with a vasectomy separating them, and what we call it, mastomizing, which is bringing it together and, and fixing it is it is a three, three hour procedure. Um, it involves, you have to do on the spot like sperm testing to make sure there's viable sperm, there's no antibodies to the sperm. So it, it's worth doing because some guys, like the, the, the success rate of a reversal is between 50 and 80%, depending on the length of time you get it. So if you have a reversal after a year, back to me exactly, you have a much higher success rate than if you wait down the line. Now, modern techniques using, you know, microsurgery techniques and stuff, it's more, it's a much more higher success rate. but. That that's where the certainty comes in. You just need to be sure of it in case it isn't reversible. But long, long story short, at that time, you're talking about 1990, around the early, like this procedure was not readily available. So Andrew said, look, um, you know, uh, I, I'm sorry, I just, uh, I, I can't do anything for you there. But, you know, and of course, he thought that was the end of it. But um, oh. lo and behold, a couple of days later, your man marched in with a rifle. Last <laughs> the secretary into his office there was a guy on the table having a vasectomy at the time i think it was like that you know that famous what was it a fatal attraction thing where he's running with the trousers but he, they're, they're still stuck around that kind of thing he was running out the door with his trousers around his ankle stuff but, <laughs> poetic license here but but basically yeah. your man has the your man has the gun and what saved him was that it was an older surgery and modern surgeries have one door in and out this had a back door to it. So Andrew actually ran out the back door and the guy tried to shoot him, I think somewhere in the, you know, upper, maybe the chest area or whatever, but Andrew jumped over the wall and shot him and caught him, shot him in the leg, shot him in the thigh, upper thigh, I think. Fell over the wall and onto a main road. And just by pure coincidence, the, the other local GP who works in the town of Clane um, uh, basically was driving by at the time. And he saw Andrew limping with the with you know wounded and stuff like that, and pulled him in and drove him to the hospital. So, wow! Uh, so what you're saying is statistically, there's more <laughs> chance of <being> shot. <laughs> Come here, show us show us the gear. What have you got first? Uh, show us what you what so, implements. So okay, so the so what do you know? So you know that there's a no scalpel, no needle vasectomy. You've heard that, haven't you? So there's, oh. there's a few ways of doing it. Okay, so the old fashioned way or the older method of doing a vasectomy was to use a scalpel on two bilateral incisions. So you're using incision both sides of this with a scalpel, which are quite larger incisions, so they need stitches and you access the two tubes that way. Do that to Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Dave wants. <laughs> uh, this is great fun actually, I'm loving this. But uh, the, uh, it was, uh, Needle, you use a needle then to just anesthetize the area. Local anesthetic, light, lidocaine is the same stuff that dentists use. So, what the modern, the, the more newer way is a no scalpel vasectomy where you make 
I suppose I can only describe it in, it, as a keyhole incision. It doesn't require any stitches, but it, it's a tiny incision that but it allows you enough space to get out the tube and clamp it and bring it out and so on. So then there's another method of for, to anesthetize as well, because most guys or a lot of guys don't like needles around that area, get very anxious and so on. So there's a spray, a special gun that was designed. Um, I'll show you this now. Okay, so this is called the Meta Jet. So the Meta Jet is, um, is, a, is a high pressure spray gun that basically, if you can see in that clear space there, Jesus, it looks like a bazooka. <laughs> it, it acts like one too, but not as not as <laughs> So the, you have the lidocaine in, in, in this area here, and then I don't know if you can see, hang on, I'll bring it into, okay, is that clear? So you see yeah, the, yeah. Way there, the large way there, kind of little. So you can, we, what I do is I isolate the tube and I bring it up into this space here, and you've got a very perpendicular kind of, you know, you drop it straight on, and then you push the spray through. So you simply, you, you, you know, that's how you, you set it up, and then I'll spray it. I don't want to hit the computer, but you'll see it here. Hang on. So as far as it is. Oh, yeah. Right. So that's a lot more, I think, I suppose, palatable for guys than sticking, say, a needle. You don't get this. Oh. You know. So then after that's done, then, obviously, you have to, we, I, you know, the, the procedure would involve, like, a sterile technique, and you'd have drapes, and you'd have all those things. You'd spray down the area, and you'd have special antiseptic spray and then when that's done then you would uh, you you essentially um you, you what i do is after i've anesthetized is what i do is i go to the center of the scrotum front center and i make a very tiny incision with this okay this is called a pointed hemostat and it's a pointed uh pointed like almost like just like forceps and basically you just put that a little bit into this and then you open it up a little bit so it'll open up like this but it's a very small amount and it opens up a tiny incision and that tiny incision then allows me to go in with this thing. This is called a ring forceps. And then I clamp the, I clamp the tube into that. Again, you go perpendicular down, and then you, you clamp it around it, and that allows me to retract it. Then you take the pointed hemostat again, and go in, and then you separate. So the, the vase, when you have it, essentially in the clamp, has a couple of different layers of muscle and fascia. Fascia is like fibrous tissue. And you just separate each each of these 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 things out when using the little kind of scissor technique with the with the pointed hemostat, and then you get down to the actual tube itself, and then you just literally clamp the tube, and then you retract it out like that. There's no pain in this. This is you can't feel any of this. It's all the area is all anesthetized, and then you de you declamp, and then you reclamp onto just the vase itself, and then you take it out, and then you strip it down any different you know bits of skin or fascia that's around it, and then you take what's called a cautery unit, which is a high temperature wire and you basically go into the upper end and when you heat up the upper end with the wire you seal it and then you separate the tubes and what happens is then is, is that you that's pretty much job done you take some of the fascia that's surrounding the tube that you've already stripped away and you pull that over wrap it over the opening of basically it's not the best way i can describe it of the upper tube and you clip with a titanium clip across that so you've got a double kind of uh, boundary there and the bottom and top tubes can't meet mechanically the bo bottom tube is left open that's called an open ended vasectomy and that's because as i said you don't want to create back pressure when you're produ producing more sperm so that's pretty much it and where does that go is that just like if it's open ended and it's stuff shooting out of it yeah but it, it's not it's not shooting out of it, no <laughs> like, you barely see this like it's just you know it, it, it's you wouldn't notice what happens is it's a good question though everyone asks that question the body sees the sperm essentially when it's not when it doesn't bind with an egg essentially as a protein that's broken down it's absorbed and recycled by the body so it's no problem there's no problem at all, all right. there you are Dave. yeah <laughs> the whole procedure takes sometimes mostly less than 10 minutes 10 minutes tops so your mom was saying there was like that little heat heating thing if i remember rightly you were saying it was like a puff of smoke it was like the it's like the smoke that comes out of the vatican chimps <laughs> The signal goes up, all is clear. <laughs> want to see what that is? Yeah, it's like it's like the the white smoke. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. can you smell? Can you smell the <laughs> tissue burning? <laughs> it's a, it's a very small amount. Most of the time, I don't even notice it now. But I'd say out of every twenty guys, one of them would make a comment. God, I could smell. You know, so you kind of sometimes, but most guys don't even notice. Yeah. So, um, do you want to see that, Dave? Do you want? Oh to see yeah. That? Here, I'll see if I the, the more information we can give him here, the more <laughs> How are you feeling, David? Indifferent. Right. Uh, as I was oh. beforehand. That's good. But in, wow. in, no. <clears throat> okay. So that's the little wire there. So. Oh, it's yeah. tiny. Yeah. 
So that's sharp. So it's not sharp. So it's not sharp at all. But what it does is okay. it's a ridiculously high temperature. In fact, you know the two, you know those batteries like the whatever A. <laughs> if you if you if I kept that button pressed, I'd burn through them in probably a minute. You know, it just. It Oof. just a ton of current, yeah. So, but it, but it, uh, it, um, so it, like it's extremely, extremely hot. But it, it, it basically, um, it's not sharp. I literally, I don't. I just literally, a tiny amount of heat in, from that will, um, will actually create a little hole, hole in the lumen, and then it just slips in and just does its thing. Oh. Yeah. But again, you don't feel any of that. So it's all like, you, and you can't see it. Well, hang on. How do you know? How many vasectomies have you had? <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I suppose when you've done hundreds of them, the guys tell you, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> the thing about it is, well, is that um, I suppose when you're like, say, when you're using like, it's, like I just, I just know, I just know. But it, it, like, you can tell when a guy is is obviously feeling something or not. So they're going to tell you. But uh, they don't. When I get to that point, there's absolutely nothing. Very rarely, you do have guys with slightly thicker scrotal skin that the anesthetic may not have penetrated as well and then that's you Dave as it, possibly <laughs> so, ask for maturity Adrian <laughs> well listen you can ask all you like well, we, we, we give a little bit more anesthetic in those instances so there's no one going to be writhing on the table or anything like that and I suppose that we have to try it out one, one, of the, one of the important things as well is that um, oh is that I tend to talk through the procedure itself, which tends to make time go quicker. Like a lot of guys, you know, just like the idea, if someone's there, you'd be talking about whatever their interests are and just chit chat away and you, you're, you're going through it all. And that helps because it offers a distraction and you're not looking at the procedure unless you really want to. I mean, I say to God, oh, if you want to, you can certainly look if you want, but I mean, most guys are just like staring up. And does, it, does anybody look at it? Rarely, but once or twice, but rarely, 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 rarely. Dave, would you be looking? Are you getting it done? Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be getting live footage to sell. That's right. We'll all be able to see Dave. You won't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, that's a good idea. We can put it on video. Are many are many men um, accompanied by their partner to the clinic? <laughs> uh, so, um. Partners would be probably fifth. No, I'd say majority of guys come in without their partner, but a lot of um, would. There are quite a few would accompany them to the to the door if you like. I, I haven't had anyone come in. As <laughs> Make sure you're going in there now. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in America, um, believe it or not, one or two of the um, of the partners came in for the actual procedure, though, and uh, that feels more like a threat, doesn't it? More than like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they. Would you would you have found many men who are lying down, going, "I'm not quite sure about this. I'm having major doubts. Rarely. My wife has put me up to it." Rarely, it happens, but rarely. Yeah, yeah. No, no. And do you go ahead with the procedure? <laughs> no, I've never had my wife has put me up to it. I'm not doing this. Never. <laughs> I've had um, I've had guys who would come in. Oh my god! Out of hundreds, maybe one actually that didn't go through it. To be honest, yeah. And it's purely like. Um, the, the, one of the most important things, and I always emphasize this, is that um, if there's a chink of doubt, if there's an absolute, you know, if I detect any level of doubt, I actually, I, I stop everything and just go, look, I think we should think about this and whatever, like, you know, so I'll always encourage that side without a question. Guys need to be sure they want this, you know, that's the most important thing. And I don't mean like they want the actual procedure of, oh, because I know that's not, you know, the, the application, <laughs> but it's the, you know, the, they want the outcome of like, you know, the, the you know, successful vasectomy. So that's, that's very important. Uh, I'd never play around with the idea if a guy was um, half cocked about it and I'm going, pardon me, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> I was wide open. <laughs> <laughs> that was a slip. But uh, <laughs> I, hope you don't, I hope you don't slip too often. <laughs> yeah, well, a metaphorical slip, so not it. But um, so um, I'd never, uh, I'd never try and press a guy on that sort of thing. Never. No. In fact, I'm the opposite. I would always say, look, you've got to think about this. Yeah. Uh, last question for me. You, you'd recommend the procedure, essentially. Yeah, yeah, it's the most effective form of contraception. It's got, I from you know, it, it, it's proven. It's definitely, for for the most part, it's a you know, I 
in my understanding, I haven't had a vasectomy. Like I'm still, we're still in the throes of. Uh, fa- I'm late to the game on the family thing, so you know, it's still on my mind. So, but but with respect to um, um, from my feedback that I get, like the pain is 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 negligible. Like you know, from that's guys telling me, but I also know from doing it. And I, I do a lot of other stuff outside of vasectomy. And you know, when you're causing somebody pain and stuff, and I know. Comfortable. So I can have a have an idea about that as well. So I think for for you know the discomfort, it's it's the psychological thing is the most probably difficult thing to get over with respect to kind of you know making the decision and then coming in. And in fairness to most guys, like they they put it out of their head, they make a date and they make a decision and they and they do it. They forget about it and then on the day when they're driving in, they it's re-enters their head and they get a little bit nervous and so on. But um, you know then after a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that they, a lot of them would say, well, I was that it, you know, and that's, that's, that's sometimes, that's a lot of the time how it works, but um, they're happy that they're on the other side, I guess, yeah. So. Yeah, the, the lesson is don't tell everybody at the Alleged Picnic and give yourself a deadline and then have your mates talk about it every week to you for the next year. That, that's the worst way about going about this. The best way to do it is on the QT. Well, I can, I can absolutely guarantee you, in the unlikely event that this does occur, you guys and our listeners will be the last to know. If <laughs> <laughs> you really want something done, you say it outwards because that way then you're not you're never gonna get any peace to get it done, you know. So Well so, he's not gonna any peace around here, Emmett, anytime soon. No. We have you our give own him a, give him a discount yeah. or something just to entice him even further. Twenty five percent off. <laughs> Of course, of course, yeah. Well, uh, if 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 I was to choose to get it done, I'd be expecting our sponsor to to pay for it, <laughs> or certainly or certainly Jer. There was no interest in such things. <laughs> I don't think that's about to happen, Dave. So you might be waiting, Doctor Emma Byrne. If anybody wants to uh, get it done by you, where's the best place to get it done? Uh, probably Bray, but vasectomy hyphen like it's two vasectomy, vasectomy hyphen Ireland dot, dot uh, com is the uh, is the address, but. The um, Bray is where I'm operating out of because Clane at the moment is a very very busy GP surgery, so we control the numbers coming in with the COVID stuff going on. So we have one in, one out kind of policy, so we can do that here. So, um, yeah. yeah good stuff. Thanks a million for explaining all that. Thanks, Emmett. Cheers, Emmett. Come on. Dr. Emmett Byrne there. Uh, Dadcast, the misadventures of parenting brought to you by Cadbury Fredo Treasures. Discover the new Fredo Treasures space series with Cadbury Dairy with Buttons and one surprise toy in every chest. Well, any anybody uh, convinced? <laughs> sorry, sorry, hold on a sec. I have a list of 28 funny things I wanted to say. To you. <laughs> <laughs> I had to stop looking at Nathan and Jerry. <laughs> I was like, just... I, so did I. So did I like, it's like when I was a kid and people would hold up their finger in front of me and go, I bet you can make you laugh. And I would like last about two seconds and then just start pissing myself laughing because I just can't control myself. Yeah, but in fairness, once you start saying half cocked and you're talking about the second, you're, you're asking for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how did you decide that you wanted to start splitting lads' ball bags in two? I, <laughs> I think it's the greatest <laughs> question of all time. Where did you well, realize your calling was to uh, hatchet people? There's so the the op- the list of options when it comes to medicine specialisms is so vast that it's um you know it's a very specific line. I well, think you just a, said a you just said it costs about yeah. four or five hundred quid, and it takes about less than ten minutes. It's not yeah, bad. There's good, yeah, there's good money in it. <laughs> Dave is getting angry about this now. I sense he is, a definite I agree. change in tone yeah. I'm really over not, the last couple of weeks. If, if the only thing that the last half, half an hour, 40 minutes has taught me is that it's removed all doubt that I am more mature than you guys are. That's, this is true. I mean, I don't, I don't think, think anybody ever doubted. Like that. No, no. <laughs> Certainly the listeners understand that you're a, a deeper thinker and uh, less shallow than the three of us. I never said less shallow now, just more mature. <laughs> uh, have we time for one quick email in? Hi. Go on. Uh, Nate Shine, I love the podcast, lads. With the kids getting back to school, how do you get the younger ones to understand the urgency to get ready and out the door without losing the plot? It often resorts to shouting, which can be a disaster as you're away from them then for six hours. He's six. Today I asked him to go outside and play with a rubber ball on an elastic string while I get the baby squirted. And within 60 seconds, he'd swung it off a wall. It came back and clocked him in the eye. He's crying. The baby's crying. And I am fuming. It's day three. The end. Uh, what do you do? Just need to be early. prepped. I was, I was very proud of myself going to bed last night. I had both lunches packed, both sets of clothes laid out, school bags by the door, ready to go, shoes by the door, everything ready to rock. 
So this morning was a relatively <clears throat> pressure-free morning. It was amazing to see them going back in. Well, the younger guy went in last week to Montessori and the older guy started at school again this morning. I have to say, our local school in Rohini ran it brilliantly. The practicalities of it were really well taken care of. He was delighted going in and he came running out telling us how great it had been and his teacher is lovely. And oh, I was just to have those few hours to myself as well, I have to say, to admit from a selfish point of view, it was great too. Uh, Aidan O'Sullivan says, oh, I wish I had those years back to do it properly. One, get up early yourself and be completely ready. Two, start the process of leaving in good time in a structured way. Teeth, coat, bag at door, out. And then uh, three, finally, calmness. These are minutes you'll never have with your child again. What strange fantasy of order is this? Asked Sarah May in response. I'd say, ride the chaos. It doesn't last long. And then Aidan went back with, uh, what I'd regret is the dad grumpiness at the door. What did it matter if we were late? That's a good one. These are from people who are, well, Aiden's certainly a bit older. It matters a little that more though? now. Exactly. You can't be late mm. today. And the, yeah. In these times, you really can't be turning up late. Yeah. And it just makes life awkward for everybody. Back in the day, look, a few minutes late, it's not the end of the world. But you just need to be a bit more prepped. Obviously, sometimes it depends on what times they get out of bed. They were both up early this morning. There have been times in the school year in the past where I've had to drag them out by the ankles because they just are in a deep, deep sleep and there's no way they're going to wake up naturally. And those mornings can obviously lead to a couple of rows because they're, they start the day incredibly grumpy. But they were brilliant this morning and, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> long may that continue. Yeah, I think we'd all like to have that idealistic morning of we sit together, we have warm porridge, we all talk about what might happen and our hopes and dreams for the day, but that's not real life. <laughs> <laughs> Why, so I, I understand getting to the door and not wanting to leave on a bad note. But that happens a million times across the day where people have little rows. Some days are good, some days are bad. We have sort of mixed thing. because some days my wife goes in. And so like this morning and yesterday morning she was working and I'm kind of like, I'm not going anywhere. What's, what's, what's the fuss? What's everyone rushing around for? I'm, like, I'm just quite calm and she's getting angry and angry at me who's just like ultra relaxed. Yet if I have to go somewhere, obviously everyone is paying for it. So... <laughs> um, like... <laughs> isn't it? Uh, isn't the worst thing to be like spending your day or your life in this guy's case, like, like regretting the, those bits and pieces? Like, do you know that only really makes it worse, doesn't it? Like, does it? Like when we were going to school, like I'm fairly sure there was the same pressure to get out. Yeah. Oh to yeah. Get up, and geez, there's things you remember from your childhood, and maybe like very few, but I don't know, rows or incidents or anything. I never remember any issue with, oh, I had to get out of the house quicker in the morning to get to school. Surely you just go to school in, and you forget about it. Of course. We lived in Mayo, though, where like, there was no traffic. In, and it turns out there's no traffic anymore in Dublin, but uh, that's not a great time. Um, Martina Skelly has a great idea. I filled a jar with little toys, fancy paper, sweets, etc. Each item had a ticket price. I bought a book of raffle tickets. I gave each kid a ticket for every day. They were in the car on time. They saved up raffle tickets to get whatever item they fancied, and it worked great. Not a bad idea because, like in our house, being married to a teacher, your house is full of charts and star charts and little incentives here, there, and everywhere. And the little feckers it doesn't take them long to. <laughs> that needs to be said at least once, once a podcast. Yeah, uh, like the two lads are wise to this and like find a moment of guilt to get an extra star here and there, and you know don't make their bed. It's still then, then they start hiding stars so they can put them on when you're not looking. All this sort of stuff. Whereas a raffle maybe takes back control. And creates problem gap a, it, down the track. It's not a raffle you, you, you buy. Is it you enticing get, you, you to gamble? Number of tickets. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of control gambling in your life. just need not to get addicted to it. Uh, right. Uh, look, I thought that was a very educational uh, podcast. I'm sure those of you who made it to the end uh, are off to get upset to me. And those who didn't were like, ah! So, you know, we've divided people. I'd like to know where Dave, I would agree with Nathan's summation earlier on, seems to be getting a little bit annoyed, a little bit angry about this whole scenario. No, 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 no. Agree? Not really. You lads can continue to beat the drum Ew, for, as long <laughs> as, um, for as long as you wish, but I will not be swayed one way or the other. And, you know, what each week will just tick into the next. And no matter how long the clamour for this procedure continues, I will, You're I will. the one who said he was getting it done. We didn't just bring this. Like, this didn't come out of thin air from us. You're yes. the one who said you were thinking about it. You were made a promise 
You got, you got a letter. 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 People, it is this weekend last year. You said it, so, so the what? year is gone, and now you're so turning what? around that we made this up. So what? And there you are celebrating your birthday, <laughs> celebrating your birthday, and all in the background, Dave, with some lovely cards. For uh, no, well, they're um, they're sixth birthday cards. If you just looked a bit closer, <laughs> I'm assuming you were getting dinosaur she, cards. So. How long do you keep the cards for before you dump them? Oh God, what? too long. For a cards. month. A month. Birthday mm -hmm. month. <laughs> now, oh. obviously, for my own birthday, six hours at, at most. But um, yeah, I'm, although I'm sure if they were not there when he woke up tomorrow morning, he wouldn't notice they were missing. But they just mm. brighten up the place a bit. Ah, uh, yeah. No, it's always the stuff that you tidy up when they're in bed. They're like, "Where's that thing that I last played with on the 29th of January, <laughs> 2008?" I've, uh, uh, can, can you see what that is for our listeners oh, who yeah. are just using the audio stream? It is a half-covered chocolate digestive, certainly in the top three biscuits in the history of biscuit making. Um, mm. I left them each with a bowl of pesto pasta to get through <clears throat> before we started to record. The first guy, the older guy, brought in the empty bowl about half an hour ago. He's already eaten half his digestive. The second guy who's standing beside me at the moment has yet to show any evidence that he deserves this digestive. So. Will you go in and get your bowl and show me how much pasta is left in it, please? And the bin as well to make sure it's not gone in there. Well, well, you know, he, would have, he, he would have had to have passed me to, to make it to the bin. So right, this right, is all happening right, here, here we go. Here we go. Well, oh, look at this. Ah, <laughs> I was taking the piss. Totally Tommy 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 He's, he's no doing way. that thing everyone used to do, you know, when your parents' friends would come over and you knew you could get away with absolute yeah. murder. Because yeah, they, be no. they, they, they can't give out to you in public. Tell him. Well, like, like Dave happen. just went, no way, pal. <laughs> Take a look. Uh, Fair enough. <laughs> he's, he has skulked away really disappointed. So you have dinner like, very early, Dave. You have well, your, your, your dinner for lunch like a country person. It was served at quarter to three, and they were only yeah. in from school at half two. So, um, Plus, I'm, I've grown tired of the daddy, I'm really hungry line at 8.15 at night. So yeah. I hear you. I, if I feed I them now, time. I'll still give them dinner in two or three hours and that will stave off the hunger, supposed hunger pains yeah, supposed. as they go to bed. Right. Uh, dadcast at offtheball.com. Dadcast, the misadventures of parenting brought to you by Cadbury Fredo Treasures. Discover the new Fredo Treasures the space series with Cadbury Dairy Milk Buttons and one surprise toy in every chest. They're treat wise with only uh, 76 calories in each one, or 77 calories if you go for the white Cadbury Dairy Milk buttons and a surprise toy in every chest. My thanks to the dads for being here this week. We'll see you next week. And uh, snip, snip. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Dadcast, misadventures in parenting. Brought to you by Cadbury Freddo Treasures. Discover the new Freddo Treasures Space Series with Cadbury Dairy Milk buttons, one surprise toy in every chest. <laughs>